In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Lord, um, we um, are going to read a lot about the courage tonight of the early apostles um, who are uh, arrested, who are persecuted, um, and yet they follow the instructions to keep preaching the gospel. We ask you, Lord, to help all of us to have even a little bit of that courage. And as we do that, Lord, uh, keep us also faithful uh, to good, prudent, but, but effective preaching and teaching, both as uh, clergy and lay people. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Good. Now, um, I'm going to mute everybody. Um, so that'll cut down any background noise, okay? All right. Now, we had uh, begun, uh, we we'd started chapter, um, uh, uh, Acts chapter uh, 5 last week, and we had that very unusual story about uh, Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, and their sort of duplicity in buying this property and then putting the money but keeping some of it back, etc. And it was a very, you know, it seemed to our modern ears to be a very excessive story of a lot of, um, you know, uh, God strikes them both dead and and Peter condemns them for their lies, and it seems so severe. And so we talked a little bit about the background to that and maybe how to understand uh, if they were at one extreme, we might be at the other extreme. But we tried to put some of contextual work and work through it the best we can, that love doesn't always just simply mean affirming and you know patting everybody on the head all the time, that there are times when um, for the better good, the good of the community, um, we see that things need to be done that that where wrongdoing is punished. Now, again, I'm not going to repeat that whole class. We can start all over again with that discussion, but we do have it uh, recorded. And um, I should, what I should do, and uh, maybe Chris, you can give me a kick in the butt to remind me to do it. I'm going to start setting up a web page um, at my blog. I'm not at my blog at my um, web, my uh, my web where it'll, it'll just have all these uh, talks from Acts of the Apostles just listed there as links and you can hot link or download it. Uh, you, you may or may not know this, but I podcast. Um, if you go to iTunes and you type in Good Catholic Sermons, it'll, the first name will come up will be once Father Charles Pope. <laughs> But um, you can get the podcast link uh, and things like that uh, there. It's fatherpope.com is where these things are listed. But if you go to iTunes, you can actually find me there and then podcast through that. I don't know about other platforms, but there is a podcast URL at uh, fatherpope.com. Okay. And all these talks that we record are put there too. Okay. So I have all my homilies and these talks. But what I want to start doing is organizing them for you so that, uh, that, you know, you can quickly go to the page that just says Acts of the Apostles. If you miss a class and you want to hear it, you can either quickly download it as an MP3 or listen to it online. But do know this, if you do iTunes uh, and you want to do the podcasting, you can podcast me. And I don't know why you'd want to, but there it is. Okay, good. Now, we had then uh, come to this, after this very uh, rather astonishing incident of Ananias and Sapphira, we have one of these summary statements that Luke gave. We looked at it, um, and, um, um, and then uh, we, this will help us bridge to our material for tonight. So I'm in Acts chapter 5 at verse 11. That's where I'm reading. Okay. It says, Now great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. And many signs and wonders were done uh, among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high honor. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes, uh, both of men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them in the beds and pallets, that even as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall upon some of them. The people also gathered from towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Okay, so we see this picture of remarkable growth, of signs and wonders, and you may recall we talked a little bit about, well, why don't we have as much of that today, remember? And we talked a little bit about, well, part of it was that we, one answer seems to be common among many theologians and some of the church fathers, that those were particular gifts given to the early church to kind of kickstart the gospel and get things rolling. 
And uh, so um, that may be an answer. It also could be that they have more faith than we do, because faith causes miracles. It's not, it's not that faith is the result of miracles, it's the cause of them. So those were some things that we discussed as well. And I, so you see, with all this growth and the apostles effectively preaching and teaching in the temple precincts, that leads us now to where we're going to pick up. Um, would somebody um, like to um, uh, do, be my reader tonight? Anybody? Okay. Oh, okay, uh, Amelia, let me unmute you and uh, let's... Uh, Okay, good. You're unmuted. Good. Why don't you read? Um, why don't you read the um, the uh, through the uh, verses of uh, seventeen to twenty? Great. Then the high priest rising up, and all they had that were there with them, all that they were there with them, which is the heresy of the Sadducees, were filled with envy, and they laid hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But an angel of the Lord by night opening the doors of the prison and leading them out said, go and standing, speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Okay, now, um, so you see that with all these converts that they're getting and, and, and the joy of the people and the healings and all the things that are going on, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are killed with jealousy, it says, right? And so they have them arrested. And it says here, they throw them in the common prison. Now, I don't know if you uh, know much about prisons in the ancient world, but um, let's just say that they make our prisons look like, um, uh, you know, four-star Marriott's, you know. Um, the, um, um, I know most Marriott's are five-star, but you know, you know what I'm getting at. So um, the, um, um, these were terrible places. Uh, they, were, they were filthy. Uh, there were no latrines. You just kind of went where you were in a corner. Um, you, um, there were, there were uh, often uh, reptiles and snakes and bugs, and it was dank and dark. There were probably very few, if any, lights. Or, you know, obviously no lights, but I mean torches, or it was dark and so on. So it's a miserable, miserable place to be put, okay? Now, uh, with all that in mind, it says, but at night an angel then opens these prison doors. Now notice the angel says, oh, you poor apostles, you've been hurt, you've been persecuted. I tell you what, just go home and don't worry. You've suffered enough uh, for the kingdom. It's just too dangerous to preach the gospel. So go home now and be safe and make sure that whatever you do, you stay safe. Is that what the angel said? <laughs> no way. It says, get your butts back out there. All right. And Go out into that temple and you speak the words of life, the words of this life to those people out there. All right. So again, <laughs> there, there's, there's this summons to courage, right? Um, you know, we often use the word encouragement today kind of as a way of, as a kind of a synonym for consolation. But listen, it's not, to be encouraged means to be summoned to courage, right? That's the original meaning of the word courage. So the angel doesn't have a lot of sympathy for them. Sorry you got arrested. This life is terrible. I tell you what, you've suffered so much. Just take a three-week break. <laughs> you know? No way. You get your butts back out there, and you preach that word. You just keep preaching that word, okay? Um, all right. And even if they kill you for it, you know, I'm adding that in, but you see the idea. Now, um, I, I say this because, again, I'm afraid that we are living often in soft times where there is very little of this in the church today, uh, where preachers and pastors and, uh, and church leaders and parents and all summon, um, summon people to be willing to suffer for the kingdom, to be willing to pay a price to preach the gospel. Um, there's very little talk of this today. I, I, I think I've told you before, I give priest retreats all over the country. I've probably given at least 20 of them. And I'll be preaching to bishops this coming January out in California. So I've, I've got, you know, I, I do a lot of clergy um, retreats and things, okay? And I'm often clear with them. I spend some time with them on this. But my brothers, we've got to prepare our people for martyrdom. This culture is heading in an opposite direction very quickly from the gospel. And it's going to get darker as we go. It doesn't, it doesn't look like things are going to just suddenly get better. Um, we're going to have to prepare people to be willing to say, you might lose your job. Uh, you, you, you might get arrested or fined. Huh? You might be decertified. Um, 
but never. Now, don't throw, don't run into the jaws of the lions. You know, Jesus did say if they persecute you in one town, you can flee to the next. But at the end of the day, you can't ultimately avoid the fact that it's going to get harder and harder to be a Christian, you know. And at some level, we have to hear this call to say, look, uh, I had to preach the gospel anyway. I can't deny Christ, and I, I, I have to be prudent, but I also have to get out there and be, be part of, uh, you know, proclaiming the kingdom. And these early Christians suffered the loss of just about everything. They were kicked out of synagogues. They, they, many of them lost their businesses. People would no longer associate with them. You can see the apostles are getting arrested. Um, and um, we, you know, let me, I'll put it to you this way. 30 of the first 33 popes died as martyrs. Only two, or two died in exile. Only one died in his bed. And we can hardly imagine suffering like that in the church today, right? So look, I'm not saying run into the jaws of the lion, go out looking for trouble. But somewhere along the line, all of us have to hear that this angel says to them, look, they're arrested. They're in a bad bed in a common prison. But the angel doesn't say, oh, poor you. Let's get back out there and do what you need to do. I'm opening these doors so you can get back out there and preach this word, okay? So uh, now, again, uh, that's not, that doesn't mean there isn't ever a place for consolation and people need a break, step back a little. I got all that. So, But I, I, I want to just say that I think, um, especially for you who are younger, that as the world goes on, it's going to get harder and harder, and you'll have decisions to make. You know, Some of you will be raising families. Uh, some of you will be in religious life or priesthood. Some of you will be community leaders. Some of you may find that you're in a, um, you know, that you're in a, um, uh, a situation where I, I just, I think I've told you this story before about a, about a pharmacist who, uh, hang on, I got a arrival. Sorry. Okay. Um, the, um, so, you know, there was a pharmacist who, who approached me and he said, you know, they say that if I don't provide abortion, uh, plan B abortion pills, you know, the, uh, the, the, the plan B is an, abort, an abortifacient emergency contraceptive, but it, it, it aborts the, the conceived child, you see the embryo. And so uh, as Catholics, we hold, you know, that we can't, we can't do that. And um, so he said, you know, the, but the, the Washington state has said, I'll be decertified as a, as a pharmacist. And what should I do? And uh, I finally had to say to him, well, you can't cooperate in evil. You know, you can't, you can't carry it. Well, what, they'll probably close me down. I said, well, Exhaust all your legal options, but at the end of the day, um, I can't tell you, hey, it's okay, go ahead, because you have a wife and a family and you got, you got bills to pay. The Lord's going to take care of you. And again, he, he, he was pretty upset with me. I think he was expecting me to pat him on the head and say, therefore, you get a pass. And again, that's just an example, I mean, of things that we, all of us are going to start facing as this world heads in a very different direction. You're expected to burn incense at these various altars of of modern ideas, you know, um, and um, uh, and you, you can't in some cases, all right? So I, I don't want to dwell on it too much longer, but I, I just want you to notice here that I think there's a word for the church today. There they are in jail. They just got arrested and the angel opens the gate and says, get back out there, okay? And you'll also have judgments to make, you know, like I'm a priest. My life is offered already in sacrifice. I laid my, when I was ordained a priest, I laid down on the cathedral floor, went right down on the floor, and I said, Lord, my life is yours. So I'm expected to live a sacrificial life, maybe in other ways, and some of you, especially when you're parents, and you have people depending upon you, you'll have some very important prudential judgments to make. But even prudential judgments don't, don't mean that you can deny the gospel, or just simply hide out, and, and can think of that as a as a, uh, as a valid option. So you're going to have to sometimes be careful and know when to fight and, and, you know, when to speak out and so on. But at the end of the day, um, folks like me have the first obligation because I gave my life away already and I should be ready to much more ready to go into danger. And the same with the religious sisters and others, you see the idea. So, uh, we're, we're, we're in slightly different categories. Um, but at the end of the day, we're all, fundamentally called to accept the fact that we're going to have to suffer for the gospel. Okay, enough said. Now, uh, if we were to read on here then, Amelia, let's read through, um, if you want to unmute, Amelia, why don't we read through, um, um, let's see, um, yeah, yeah, verse 25, uh, read through verse 25. Okay, great. Who having heard this, 
early in the morning, entered into the temple and taught. And the high priest coming, and they that were with him called together the council and all the ancients of the children of Israel, and they sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the ministers came and opening the prison, found them not there, they returned and told, saying, the prison indeed was found shut with all diligence and the keepers standing before the doors, but opening it, we found no man within. Now, when the officer of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were in doubt concerning them and would and what would come to pass. Yeah, you know, these guys seem to have some kind of, uh, you know, they just seem to have somebody looking over them. <laughs> you know, they're very much perplexed. He says, you know, it's hard to, you know, it's hard. This is not, this is not the first time that they slipped away. And Peter later on is going to be released from prison one more time by an angel. So again, uh, there is, they are very perplexed. They say these guys seem to be able to escape our grasp. These people seem to be popular. There's all kinds of things that, uh, that they're able to do, miracles. What are we to make of this? Um, but they're not perplexed enough to say, hmm, maybe we better start listening to them a little more and find out what their teaching is really all about. And Maybe this Jesus guy is for real. They're not going to go that way. No, they're not. They're not. They're not ready. They're ready with that yet. Uh, so again, these are ways of just saying, though, that um, they're 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 very very much perplexed uh, about what to do uh, because these people seem to have the hand of God upon them, and they seem to have the protection of the angels. All right. Now, with that in mind, go ahead and read now uh, when they finally do. Um, um, go, go back out. So starting with verse, uh, uh, you know, 26 there immediately. Uh, 26. Okay. Then went the officer with the ministers and brought them without violence for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. Continue. Mm -hmm. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them saying, commanding, we command you and you should not teach in this name. And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you have a mind to bring the blood of this man upon us. All right, so you can stop there. Now we have then um, a situation here where um, um, there's a, you know, the, 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 we commanded you not to speak in this name, but here you are. Notice it says here, and they, they, they're giving them credit here, right? They say, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. You, you know, you, uh, we, we, you filled Jerusalem, and, uh, and it says you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, uh, this is a very controversial uh, thing that we're about to talk about. You may remember when the movie The Passion of the Christ was made. That's actually a long time ago now, so I, mean, I don't know how old that movie is now. But there was a great uh, uproar among the Jewish people when Mel Gibson's movie was about to come out. And there was this line in there, which is in the Bible, where they cried out, uh, his blood be upon us. Pilate says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And the crowd cried out, his blood be upon us and upon our children. Now, um, Mel Gibson did decide ultimately to remove that line uh, from the movie, but it did set up a great debate because it is in the scriptures. And um, so as, as the crowd, you know, the, the, led by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, told them, his blood be upon us and upon our children. Now, they were obviously using hyperbole, but in other words, we're willing to accept this, you know, his blood being upon us and upon our children. Now, the sad thing is, and the reason why it's controversial, is that down through the centuries, many people have said that's why the Jewish people are cursed. And that's why the Holocaust happened, or that's why uh, people have, there's been so much anti-Semitism down through the, uh, through the ages because uh, the Jews brought a curse upon themselves and, um, and God has not favored them. And, and this also would allow some people to think it's okay for us to persecute them or be anti-Semitic. And so again, you can start to see that this is a pretty ugly interpretation of that text, right? And let's be honest, it's always been the Catholic and Christian tradition to say that, that every human being who's ever sinned is responsible for the blood of Jesus Christ, not just the Jews or the Romans who killed him. Yes, it's Pontius Pilate who sentenced him. Yes, it was the Jews at that time who called for this, but they simply represent all of us. 
you know, uh, all of us are sinners in need of God's mercy. So the, the controversy of that line was removed from the movie. Um, some people were disappointed because they said, well, it is what the Bible says they said, and they wanted it to be more authentic. Others said, well, look, this has been so um, used or weaponized, this, this text, uh, against the Jewish people for so many centuries that it's probably good to remove it, okay? And the Catholic Church would be very sensitive to anti-Semitic things. Uh, even in our own prayers, we've removed some prayers uh, from the older prayer books that we used to have. Uh, that uh, prayed for um, the uh, conversion of the Jews in very polemical language. Now, um, with that in mind, though, you notice again, there is this sort of reference back to that cry that the Sadducees themselves and the Pharisees, these very men who led that protest and cried out, let his blood be upon us and our children for heaven's sake. Fine, Pilate, you're not responsible. We'll take the responsibility, but crucify him. All right, that's kind of what they meant by that. And they seem to have forgotten that they said that, and they say to them, you're trying to bring this man's blood upon us, see? And yet, isn't that, and you're going to see in Stephen's speech, and likewise, Peter says, you killed the author of life. You know, they're, they're, they're not letting these guys off the hook. And they're, they're making accusations, but they're saying, but Jesus still loves you. If you come to him, he'll save you. So we'll talk more about the kerygma in a minute. But at the end of the day, uh, this is a very provocative line. And it, isn't it interesting that they have so soon within, you know, less than 50 or 60 days, forgotten what they had shouted and are saying that you want to bring this man's blood upon us. But the more positive thing is it says, you have filled Jerusalem with this teaching. See, isn't that a beautiful testimony to their courage, to their preaching, and to the work of the Holy Spirit, that this work of these 12 unlikely uh, leaders and, and charismatic preachers have now filled Jerusalem with the doctrine and the teaching, okay? So, any, before we go any further, would there be any comments or questions from anyone here at this point? Okay, Kate? I just had a quick question um, about the attitude of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. um, Amelia's translation in verse 17 used the word envy, and mm -hmm. in my translation, it's jealousy. Um, mm. I know in the past you've spoken about, you know, the difference between envy and jealousy. And so I was just wondering if you had any comment on that. Yeah. Let me run and get my Greek text here. Hang on a second. <clears throat> yeah, my version also likes to say hath and shall a lot. The Dewey Reams. <laughs> it's good. It's traditional, but. It's... No, I like reading? your translation, Amelia. It's fun to listen to. <laughs> Is that the Dewey you're reading from? Yes. Okay, good. It's, uh, and as you know, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, beautiful, uh, but it, it sometimes has words that, uh, yeah, the, the word order and things is a little more literally done. Okay, now, uh, this is, what verse is that you're re uh, concerned about? Um, it, verse 17, um, and I have the uh, NRSV. Okay. My, and it uses the word jealousy instead of envy. Yeah. So Acts 5 and verse 17 is what, I mean, is that right? No. Yeah, um, Acts 5, verse 17. Yeah, okay. Let me see what the Greek text says here. <clears throat> yeah. Huh. Sorry, it's taking half a minute here. <clears throat> All right. Ah. Oh, I see, 17. Okay. And rising up the high priest said to him, this exam, and all of this. I just said we're filled with, um, okay. Yeah, as, as they, they do, um, yeah. So again, the envy would be the better translation here from the Greek because, um, and it also, I think, shows you, we, we have talked about the distinction between envy and jealousy. So the Greek word here is probably better translated envy. And but just like in English, there can be a little overlap between jealousy and envy, but theologically, we distinguish uh, pretty different. They're very different. Now, here's the, for those of you who are new to the class and have not heard me make this point, when I'm jealous of you, there's something good about you or something good that you have that I want to possess, and perhaps inordinately, in other words. Uh, so that's jealousy. But when, when I'm envious of you, there's something good or excellent in you that I want to destroy because it makes me look bad by comparison or it somehow harms my standing 
among other people. So it began when you were kids in the classroom or in the playground. There was always that kid up front with the bo thick bottle glasses, teacher's pet, always getting straight A's. And the teacher would say, well, Johnny got an A and the rest of you got C's and D's. Why can't you be more like Johnny? So we would go to Johnny on the playground and say, teacher's pet, and we kind of rough him up. And basically say to him, you're making us look bad, buddy. Stop being so excellent. Stop doing so well. That's envy. St. Augustine calls envy the diabolical sin because jealousy, I want to possess the good. With envy, I want to destroy the good. You see the idea? And why? Because somebody else's excellence or goodness makes me look bad by comparison or lowers my standing as I see it in the community. Okay? Now, you can see why envy is a better word here just contextually because they see the goodness of these apostles. They see the miracles they're working. And instead of saying, wow, we better go listen to these guys. They've, they've met the Lord and the Lord's doing important work through them. Let's go listen and get to know them. They say, no, we have to destroy them because they're threatening us. They're threatening our standing. Um, they're threatening the, uh, the doctrines that we see uh, as most essential. And uh, so this is, I think, the better translation there. And it helps explain their motivation more, right? Would that they were jealous. <laughs> At least they could try to possess the good thing. Hey, let's, let's go find out how they're working all these miracles and let's try to steal the power or something like that, you know. But they just simply want to destroy the, good, the goodness. And by the way, the reason that St. Augustine calls it envy the diabolical sin is that, that that was a fundamental sin of the devil because he saw the excellence of Adam and Eve and that they shared in God's glory and in image and likeness. And it just made him rage, rage with, with envy. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? All right. Now, um, we're going to see now a kind of a shortened version of the kerygma. It's not complete here, uh, but we're going to see how the apostles answer. So I think, Amelia, if you could start at verse 29. But Peter and the apostles answering said, we ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers hath raised up Jesus, whom you put to death, hanging him upon a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and remission of sins. And we are witnesses of these things and the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to all that obey him. Okay, now you're going to see, obviously, they're not happy when they hear this, but, <laughs> but it, it's a shortened version of the kerygma. You, for, for, for those of you who may be new to the class today, or had word, the kerygma is just a jazzy Greek term, which means the early of apostolic preaching. And it has certain components that a lot of geeks use big words for, but I have a more colloquial way of putting, here's the kerygma, here's the basic content of the kerygma. You got it bad, and that ain't good. But there is a doctor in the house, and his name is Jesus. And if you will give yourself to him and let him go to work in your life, he will save you from the mess you are and the mess you've made. But you have a decision to make. You've got to decide one way or the other about him. You will either choose him and let him go to work, or you will decide against him and you will die in your sins. You know, that's the basic kerygma. Now, he stops short here a bit. He does make sure that you killed the author of life. You got it bad and that ain't good. Um, nevertheless, God exalted Jesus and so on. So there is a doctor in the house and he's been exalted and he's now the one to whom all people can look to, to be saved, uh, and, and, and receive the forgiveness of their sins. And it stops short, uh, at least from Luke's point of view here, because they, they're enraged and they kind of interrupt Peter, but uh, so he can't even finish, you know, the, the basic kerygma, but you start to see the, the fundamental elements and in a way, Modern preaching doesn't always have these items, at least not all of them, right? Uh, very too many preachers are reticent to say to a congregation, and by the way, he's including himself, we got it bad, and that ain't good, okay? A lot of preachers don't want to even do that, let alone saying, uh, you know, we like to say, well, Jesus loves you, he's going to help you, but from what? If you don't know the bad news, the good news is no news. So, you know, in other words, and then you've got to get to that point where you finally say, you've got to really make a decision about Jesus. He's either your Lord and your Savior and you're going to obey him, or he's just some hippie dude who made promises and, and was basically a lunatic because he claimed to be God 
and forget about them. But you know, you've got a decision to make. You either accept them and be saved, or you'll, you'll, you'll reject them and be lost. We don't like to talk like that today, and we almost never do, and preachers almost never speak like that. Maybe not in, you know, some of us do, but maybe not in quite those blunt of terms, but that's the basic outline of the fundamental apostolic preaching that, that all preaching should still be based on. But we've just decided to kind of give, you know, a thought for the day or pleasantries, let's hope the team wins and that kind of stuff. So I think I told you um, every, every homily I ever heard growing up, I could summarize in three sentences. Okay, so Jesus is challenging us to do better today. Let's try to do better. Now stand for the gospel. I mean, stand for the uh, creed. Really, that that's, that's that pretty much summarizes it. You know, how's he challenging us to do better? Do better? What, what, in what way? What do I need to do? You know, not very little, very skimpy on the details. Very generalized. A lot of generalities and abstractions. No real hard hitting. Here's the deal: such and so is a sin. If you're doing it, you need to stop. And if you're struggling, go to God and get on your knees and say, help me. But don't call good or no big deal what God calls sin. You know, very seldom do we hear these things. Okay, enough said. I'm getting preachy. <laughs> but I am a preacher. <laughs> okay, silly me. Uh, now, we, we see that um, uh, they interrupt him, basically. So now, verse 33, uh, Amelia. When they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they thought to put them to death. But one in the council rising up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, um, a doctor of the law, respected by all the people, commanded the men to be put forth a little while. And he said to them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do, as touching these men. For before these days rose up Theodos, affirming himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and that all believed him were scattered and brought to nothing. After this rose up Judas of Galilee, and the days of the enrolling, and drew away the people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as consented to him, were dispersed. And now, therefore, I say to you, refrain from these men, and let them alone, for if this counsel or if this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest perhaps you be found even to fight against God. And they consented to him. Okay, let's just stop there for a minute. Um, now, uh, this is very, by the way, Gamaliel, we've been introduced to Gamaliel. Just guess who is the, the one of the best students and one of the uh, of, of this of this prominent teacher in Jerusalem, one of his chief students. Anyone know who I'm talking about? Is it Saul? Yes, yeah, yeah, Saul, uh, later known as Paul, exactly. And you start to see, therefore, how Paul Paul's conversion wasn't just sort of by chance. Uh, that he had a teacher who was very careful, and he said, "Now look." We need to uh, not just react and just try to you know, blow these guys away because it seems like every time we, 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 we beat them up or we do something to them, uh, they just keep growing. Um, you know, uh, we crucified their, their leader and yet look at them, they're growing. And uh, uh, we see that, uh, you know, now if we arrest them and we do more killings and, you know, whatever, uh, you know, we, we've got to be careful here. Look, he says, don't worry. If this is a man, it's going to fail. It's going to go away. And if it's of God, you really can't stop it. Pretty good advice. Now, I'm not saying this is the only advice we can ever follow. There are going to be times where we just need to confront heresy and not just ignore it. But there's a lot of times in life where you have to say, you know, let's just, and the church has this um, tendency that a lot of people find annoying, especially when I was a younger man, especially, I was always very impatient. Oh, the church is always 100 years behind. You know, these crazy nutty things are going on all over the place and we got nothing to say. We're wringing our hands and we're debating about stuff people worried about 100 years ago. We're always behind the times. But to some degree, I've discovered there's a wisdom in the church to kind of wait things out and to kind of let a few things just sort of die out on their own and not just, you know, use a cannon to kill a fleer. If you come thundering down with a sledgehammer, sometimes you make people into martyrs and uh, their cause grows. Uh, so there's a kind of a prudence here in saying, let's... Uh, 
let's wait this out. Um, if it's not of God, it's going to go away. If it's if it is, we're going to be we're going to be we can't stop it, and we might even be found opposing God, which, by the way, is not a good thing. You ought not be opposing God. That's not a good idea. Not a good plan for life. Okay, so um, you see the the vision here. Now it's again it's a it's a provision in the sense that. There are going to be times when your parents, for example, um, some of you already are, some of you have been parents, you know, where you'll sort of let your kids sit and make a few of their own mistakes. My dad ha had that expression. He says, uh, sometimes you just got to let a few people make their own mistakes, you know, and really learn. Uh, you know, you can't always micromanage and make sure that nothing bad is ever done or said or happens. Sometimes you just got to let a few, but other times you have to be very vigilant and say, no, uh, and you see trouble coming and you head it off. And there's always going to be a prudence in that. Um, prudence means not caution, but it means given the circumstances and the real goal, what's the best way forward here? Do I have to kind of you know, nip this in the bud, so to speak? Or do I just kind of need to let it play out and um, let, let my son or daughter make a few of their own mistakes and figure out uh, that they need to uh, straighten up and fly right? So these will be decisions in some of your future, some of you who are older, that you have already had to make these decisions <laughs> and it wasn't easy, was it? <laughs> you weren't always sure you got it right. Um, I'm, as a pastor, sometimes I have to allow things that I, would, I, I don't really like in the parish to go on for a while before I think it's time to either deal with it or just see if it just sort of ends, just leaves on its own. One example of this, we used to have lots of gambling trips. I mean, my God, all the organizations, you know, tw you know, two times a month we're taking buses up to Dover Downs or Dover, whatever place, you know, gamble, gamble, gamble. Is this really, you know, what we really want in the church? You know, is that really, there was an awful lot of time and money being spent on stuff like that. And I, rather than stomp on it and say, yeah, you know, I just kind of let, and it's kind of just died out on its own. You know, we don't do that anymore. You know, it's not part of our parish life. And even bingo, we had, when I came here, we had bingo and that eventually went away too. It's just, um, I'm not saying these are intrinsically evil things, but you know what I mean? You just realize there's too much time and energy, but why, why just use a sledgehammer and offend people and tell them what you're doing is all wrong? Well, Father, it's a fundraiser for the poor, whatever you call it. So you see what I'm saying? Sometimes you just sort of, you know, think. other times you have to say, no, that absolutely can't continue going on in this church. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot be associated with this group meeting here or whatever, and I have to say no. So I don't know, I'm, I'm not saying I always got it right. I'm just saying that um, this, these are the, the decisions that are in all of our lives, okay? But I think Gamaliel's advice here for them is pretty important because they're stomping on these guys and every time they stomp, it just things just keep growing. So the rule then of stomping on people, if it, if it makes them grow, stop stomping, <laughs> you know? And that's his advice. Uh, and let, let the, if this is not of God, let, let, let put it in God's hands and trust that God will bring it to an end. Otherwise, you might be opposing God himself. Okay. Now, uh, remarkably, he is of such influence that we see here that they took his advice. But sort of. So let's see what they do, Amelia. Verse 40. And calling in the apostles, after they had scourged them, they charged them that they should not speak at all in the name of Jesus, and they dismissed them. Mm -hmm. and now, might, oh, go on, I'm sorry. That might not be the full scourging that Jesus got. It was more of a, of a the, the Greek word here is more of a sense of a beating with rods rather than the scourging that tears the flesh. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. Continue. And they indeed went from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were accounted worthy to suffer reproach for the name of Jesus. And every day they ceased not in the temple and from house to house to teach and preach Jesus, Christ Jesus. Yeah. Well, um, look at again, I just this model of courage. Uh, you know, when the authorities threaten to stomp on you, and the police pull you over and you're brought in and you get to, you know what I'm saying? You can get pretty scared, you know? Um, I mean, you know, I, I think that uh, at some level, um, we, um, you know, we're, we're going through some of that now, you know, it, you know, you walk into the, you forget to put your mask on, you go into the Safeway and a police officer confronts you and like, whoa, you know, I mean, you can feel pretty anxious pretty fast, you know? So, um, you know, even for a little thing like that, but you know, you think about being hauled in, you being threatened by people in authority who have the power to really, they can, they can have you put to death. They can make your life pretty miserable. 
So you see, fear is a, is a major thing that we have to learn to confront in our life. Um, and um, whatever your f feelings are about this virus, it's going to stay with us, it looks like, for a while. So the question is, you know, what's prudent? And, uh, but I think we have to also accept the fact that fear is a huge factor in this. And the world is filled with risk and lots of bacteria and lots of viruses and other, all kinds of other dangers. You just walk out your door and get in your car and you're in a death device. You know, somewhere along the line, we're going to have to recover a, a, a sense of confidence and so on, uh, because this, this virus isn't just going to go away, it looks like. Maybe, maybe there'll be a sudden cure, but somewhere along the line, um, we tried to, what do they call it, bend the curve so we could keep the hospitals from being overwhelmed. But now people are saying, no, you got to stay hunkered down until there's a cure. And I'm sorry, that's just not going to be possible. And we're going to have to face our fears and get back out there little by little. And those who have good reason to stay in probably should. You know, the older folks, those who are, have kind of compromised immune systems, we have to all make personal decisions. But collectively, we all have to say, is my fear more than it should be in this case? Or is it appropriate? So we're always going to have this conversation with fear. There are times when fear is a good thing. It's a healthy thing. God gives it to us so we don't walk off edges of cliffs or do completely foolish, stupid things. On the other hand, fear can become over the top and uh, it seizes us. Uh, you've heard the old acronym, fear, false evidence appearing real, right? So I leave it to your judgments. I'm not here to say this is exactly what we must do as a country and so on. But the fact of the matter is we are reopening and there is going to be risk. And there's always risk in life. And that's part of where we have to say, all right, that, I, that there's going to be a risk. The question is, um, given my situation and my circumstances, you know, is that risk something I'm going to have to just fear, you know, deny my fear and get out there and get back to work? Or is it something that I still need to stay in for a while because I'm older and so on? So I'll leave it to your discussion. But you, you, you see, though, the, the picture of heroism here. But also notice joy. They are rejoicing that they were deemed worthy to suffer for the sake of the name of Jesus, right? So, we, you know, here's another danger, I think, that when you're, when somebody's angry with you, uh, or you're experiencing some rebuke, that sometimes there's a tendency to think that I did something wrong. And I think there's even a primitive instinct. You know, when we were little children and our parents looked mean or looked like they were angry, oh, I must have done something wrong. What did I do? What did I do? See, now here's an important thing to remember. Just because somebody's angry with you doesn't mean you did anything wrong. But there's that primal reaction that can set up in us. You know, oh, uh, I'm, I'm being questioned by authorities. I've broken rules. Uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I've done something wrong. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's... Um, Maybe it's just uh, that they're, they're, they're the ones who've done something wrong. So again, I would simply say that, remember this rule, very important rule to try to memorize. Just because somebody's angry with you or threatening you doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It, it doesn't mean you're completely, you've done nothing wrong, but you see the idea. It doesn't necessarily mean that you did anything wrong, okay? So you correct somebody or we'll say, well, you're wrong about that. This is the actual thing that happened. Oh, you're, again, Okay, so they're angry, but that doesn't mean you did anything wrong in correcting the facts, see? So be careful because there is this primitive, fear is a very deep and primitive thing in us. And it can be easily triggered. And we have to sometimes step back and say, look, they say, they say we've got to obey God. Now, God told us to get out here and preach this word. And the angel who let us out of prison said, get out there, get your butts out there and preach this word. That's your mission. That's what God's telling us to do. We can't say God's wrong and you're right. We can't do that. God has spoken to us. See? Okay? All right. Now, it's getting uh, into the nine o'clock time. We've been at it about 45 minutes. Now, what I want to do is find a little time uh, to get into the next chapter. But before we do, um, we have some questions, comments, rebuttals. So, Julia, I see your hand is up. Uh, just a quick question. Um, in verse... Sorry, I'm looking at it on a phone. It's small. Mm -hmm. On verse, at verse 33, um, they, it says, when they heard this, in my translation, which is from the USCCB, it says, when they heard this, they became infuriated. And when Amelia read it, she said they were cut to the heart. 
Mm. And that to me sounds very different. Uh, yeah, to me, it sounds yeah. like the Sanhedrin, like maybe felt like, you know, something stirring that was godlike. <laughs> um, and so I'm just wondering what, mm. how we should take that. Okay, and the ones hearing this were cut. Yeah, uh, shismos. Yeah, literally means cut. Um, it doesn't. It, it it doesn't indicate literally cut to the heart. It says here uh, we're cut. Uh, the word shism or shiz, like you ever get the word scissors. Mm -hmm. So the Greek word is cut. Now it's interesting. You're right, and this is this leads us, um, Julia, to a very interesting question about Bible translations um, and how words are used in one era and what they mean in a different era. So, for example, you are making this point, they were cut to the heart, almost sounds like repentant or sorrowful. Um, but when the Douay Reims was written, and this is a, this is a, English was a, that was almost 500 years ago. And modern English, you know, the, the, a lot of the ways we use terms were a little bit different. And so this is one of the reasons why some people say, well, beautiful though the King James is and the Douay, we have to be careful when we read them because sometimes they use words the way they were meant 500 years ago. Um, for example, 500 years ago, you could say that a woman was homely and you meant it as a compliment. It meant that she, she was um, a, a great mother. She, she kept a great home. Now homely means ugly. See, okay. words change over time. Um, so, or for example, um, some of the older translations say, oh God, who are very awful. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, we, awful always means a negative thing to us, but they meant full of awe. We're, you're awesome, in other words. That's what it meant. So you see, over time, words change. So the question, when you use an older translation, you're reading it for its beauty and also its kind of literalness, right? Uh, in other words, it is closer, more, more literal to the Greek uh, and, and the uh, Hebrew text those older translations, but sometimes we're still a little bit stuck because our modern English ears can't, you know, hear the subtleties of that. Now, therefore, to be cut, it says here, it doesn't say literally cut to the heart, it's just a schismos, means they were cut. Um, like someone, someone has stabbed them, you know, there's a stabbing pain uh, in that sense. So um, there's, um, I think that the English translation you read is for our ears, gives us a better idea of what's being said, even if Amelia's version gives us a more literal rendering of the Greek, uh, the Greek word, okay? But sometimes literal isn't always the best because our English use of words changes over time, if that helps. Thank you. So th these are the questions when you choose a translation uh, to use. Um, edifying would be Douay and King James, uh, but more readable might be things like the, or the NAB, uh, like you were reading from there, uh, or what I'm, I'm encouraging the English Standard Version, you know. So, okay, some ideas. Another question? All right. Well, let's get into the, oh, I'm sorry, Amelia, go ahead. Okay, so um, my question is kind of going back to verse 39 and just the whole, um, the whole idea of that, essentially, if something's of God, then it will withstand the test of time. If something's of man, you know, it'll die out, fizzle out over time. So my question for us as like a call to action type thing, where, what's the fine line between like kind of having apathy and leaning into that, well, God will take care of things, external locus of control versus individual agency and like what my role is and like affecting change or calling, you know, preaching truth to power and those sorts of things. So I just want to know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, again, God says, I got this. Um, but one of the ways I got this is I've got, I've got, you, in my, uh, I've got you in my plan. <laughs> There's an old saying of St. Augustine, the God who saved you, or God who made you without you will not save you without you. Okay? So in other words, right now, as members of the body of Christ, we're in the church militant. That, that, that is to say, we are the church engaged in this battle on earth. The church triumphant is in heaven, the church militant is on earth, and the church suffering is in purgatory. So as a member of the church that is militant, we have a battle to engage. Now the question for you and me uh, is, is what is my role in that battle? If you're a parent, obviously your first role is to raise up your kids, right? Teach them the faith, 
without compromise um, and uh, help them to uh, become decent human beings who are on their way to heaven, okay? Um, as a pastor, I have a parish. That's my first obligation. Um, I also do online stuff. I'm out there because I'm a writer and uh, uh, over, over the years I've gotten, you know, fairly widely read and known and I'm on the radio three times a week. So I have those kinds of roles. That's my, my, my position in the trench. So the question is, what are your weapons? What are your gifts? What does God expect of you? So yes, God, God has, as the church is indefectible. As I said to you before, uh, nations have come and gone, empires have risen and fallen, all in the age of the church, and here we still are, and they're all gone. Every enemy, Napoleon, Caesar, where are they now? They're all dead, and we're still here preaching. So, well, yes, the church is indefectible, but part of the reason or part of the way God keeps the church that way is because he's got people like you and me studying this word, trying to live this life, and teach others and, and, and engage the battle. So that would be... A, a, so to just maybe go back to Augustine, God who made you without you will not save you without you. You're meant to be in, engaged, as you said, as agents. How did you put it, Amelia? Agents of moral agents? Yeah, I said individual agents of change. Yeah. yeah. And so we're part of God's plan. And we have an indispensable role. Uh, you might have heard my five hard truths that will set you free. Number two is your life isn't just about you. And you're part of a bigger picture. God has a plan for you. God has something for you to do, not just for your sake, but for others. So everything isn't just about personal enrichment, all right? So that's hard life of hard, hard truth of life number two. If you accept it, it'll set you free. Okay. All right. Um, let's read a few more verses about the calling of the first deacons, and then that'll set us up for what well, we'll start with next week about the stoning of Stephen. So we're heading now into chapter six of Acts. And um you know, again, I don't mind. I mean, if you want to keep being my reader, but if anyone else feels so inspired and would like to read, that's a possibility too. So anyone else? Okay, Amelia, look, oh, oh there you go. Joy will read, okay? So we're reading uh, Joy from the, um, um, let's read the first uh, two verses of chapter six. Now, during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the 12 called together the whole community of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait at tables. Okay. Now, at, at, at first glance, this could seem a little insulting. Um, as if the apostles were saying, serving tables and taking care of the poor, this is beneath us. We are, we are engaged in the study of the word and we are too busy for these things, you know, to be bothered by these things. So you see how one could interpret it that way. But I think what's really being said is just the opposite, that the apostles are basically saying, look, the care of the poor is very important, too important to depend on us who are engaged in other things and don't have the time to give that we should have. So let's, Let's choose certain people who will be dedicated to this work so that, um, we'll, as we'll see here, they're going to appoint these deacons, but who will be dedicated to this work because this work is important, see? But so is the other work that we're doing. So we need to say that uh, maybe this is more the way to understand that the apostles aren't just saying this type of work is beneath us. Um, they do have a, a particular work to, you know, uh, focus on the word of God, the preaching and the teaching spreading of the gospel, celebrating of the sacraments, right? So, and you notice again, there is this um, racist sort of development that the Hellenists, namely the Greek-speaking widows, uh, are being neglected, it, it is said, in favor of the, Hel of the Jewish or the Hebrews speaking. In other words, you have the Jewish converts and the Greek converts to the faith. And the argument is that the, uh, that the Hebrew or Jewish converts are being favored. Was this literally true or not? I don't know, but certainly we all know, you know, it, um, racism isn't just in a modern American problem, y'all, okay? Uh, the racism of Jesus' time was Gentile versus Jew, and it was pretty, it was pretty serious stuff. You know, you, no Jew would ever go into the house of a Gentile or touch anything that a Gentile had touched by way of utensils or ever, ever, um, you know, really have any serious, um, interaction with a Gentile, and the Gentiles returned the scorn. Um, 
this was a, and you know, you encounter it, uh, the woman at the well, that story. And later on, we'll see the first baptism of, of the first Gentile convert, Cornelius. We saw, you know, we'll see these things as they, as they're laid out for us. So again, there's, um, a lot of, um, um, uh, you know, like I say, r racial and ethnic things going on here that are ugly. And it just shows you that the early church wasn't free of all this stuff, okay? Now, what's interesting is that really all these people were Jewish converts because there hasn't been a Gentile converted, uh, they're brought into the faith yet. That's not going to happen until Acts chapter 10. Shame on the early church. <laughs> it took 10 chapters to get there. But the, the, the Greek-speaking Jews were, came from the diaspora. They, they lived in places out in like Babylon and places up uh, in Greece and Macedonia, and they didn't speak Hebrew. And in really the Hebrews didn't even speak Hebrew. They spoke Aramaic. So, but again, they thought we're the more pure Jews because we've lived in Jerusalem. We live in the Holy Land. We're in the Promised Land. And we're, we're all that. And, and uh, the, the, one, the other ones who live out in the, what's called the diaspora or the dispersion uh, aren't really uh, serious Jews, and they have some practices and things that are pretty lame. And uh, they're not as uh, orthodox as we are. So these were more internal struggles, more between language groups even than racial groups at this point. Okay. So let's read on, uh, Joy, and find out what's, what's done. Therefore, friends, <clears throat> select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and full of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task. While we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. <laughs> okay, I love that last line. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, we have here, um, then again, the solution is to, so, so to pick seven men. Why seven? Well, it's a kind of a Jewish number. You know, Jews like number seven. It's a, it's a perfect number, uh, even though it doesn't sound that way to our ears. Uh, but for Jews, uh, the number seven meant the, the perfection of something. So you notice we have seven sacraments. We have seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. We, you see the idea. So um, <clears throat> now um, they they actually named them, um, and uh, we're gonna we, we're gonna focus on Stephen starting with next week, where he preaches the sermon. He's almost immediately martyred within days <laughs> of being named a deacon. Okay, um, we'll we'll see that. Uh, Phil, uh, so we have Philip. Uh, he's going to be a great uh, evangelizer. Uh, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenaeus, and Nicholas. Uh, now, Nicholas seems to have become a heretic at some point. In the book of Revelation, there's a group related, known as the Nicolaitans, uh, who held a heresy of kind of a Gnostic heresy, um, and, uh, and also some sexual uh, uh, deviancy. Now, uh, is this for sure the Nicholas who was named a deacon? A lot of the church fathers say yes, and not all of them agree. Uh, not every biblical scholar would agree, but it um, looks like maybe one of them went bad. Mm. Well, here we go, y'all. Um, even Jesus didn't get it all right. One of his apostles went bad, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, you might say that um, uh, every now and again, we look at the, the number of priests who go bad. I don't know the percentages. Uh, let's just say he said about two to three percent of the priests uh, uh, through this period have been involved in these abuse scandals and other other things like that. Um, let's even say, you know, as many as five percent of priests struggle and maybe commit moral things that are wrong and eventually leave the priesthood. Um, but, uh, you know, one, one twelfth of Jesus uh, apostles went bad and uh, we see that to one fifth, 20 percent in this case, of the deacons, you know, and I, that's obviously, I'm being silly when I say 20%, you just have a, a number of, uh, I'm sorry, not 20%, it was seven. So, but you get the idea, um, about 12% went bad. Now, um, 
All I wanted to say to you is that you're going to expect, sadly, that even among those who are chosen for high offices, there's going to be some bad eggs among them. Some who go bad, some who lose their way. Um, my father had an expression, Charlie, people disappoint. You know? uh, again, this isn't just like you were mentioning earlier, Amelia, to just say, well, you know, these things happen and just throw up our hands and, you know, be sort of uh, uh, neutral to these things. We need to really work for, uh, for, uh, identifying clergy that are struggling and finding them help and getting them out of, out of harm's way so they don't hurt other people. We need to work a lot more. The church should be self-correcting. All right. But again, one of these, uh, Nicholas may have gone bad. And you'll read about that in the book of Revelation where Christ rebukes the, I think it's the church of, uh, of, of the Laodiceans who follow uh, and allow the teaching of the Nicolaitans to flourish in their midst. Okay. All that aside, the general thought though here is that these men, notice again, they're not just named uh, committee heads. They have hands laid on them. That's an ordination, see? So these early, and by the way, the word deacon isn't used here, although this reading is used in the ordination of deacons, uh, but it is, the, the call these men to this service, to this diaconia. Hmm? So they're not formally called deacons, but they are called to this diaconia in Greek, meaning this service. So um, we see that um, they, they, and they have hands laid upon them, which is an ordination right, all right? So they're not just now ordinary, just committee heads, you know, if you, if you pardon the expression, uh, or chairman of the committee or whatever. These are now ordained clergy. They, they have the rank of deacon. Um, there's, so now we have bishops, priests, and deacons. Uh, we've, see, we, we've seen present, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see all these offices present, okay? Um, now, um, it says here in verse 7, again, this is just one of those summary statements of Luke to kind of get us to the next movement. And therefore, the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of priests were obedient to the faith. And this is my final line. It, it, I think in the translation from the NAB, in fact, is it, was it Julia? Do you have that? Even a great number of priests, has it had the word even? Can you read that out of that translation? It says even a large group of priests were becoming obedient to the faith. <laughs> Don't you love it? <laughs> now, let's, let's contextualize it. Priest here means not just uh, the Catholic priest. It means the Levitical priest from the Old Testament. In other words, those uh, who were engaged in the liturgy of the temple. Uh, so uh, the sons of Levi, you know, the, uh, the tribe of Levi, the Levites, so to speak, um, the, the priest. But still, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Even a great number of priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Um, you, you know, in our time, you have to laugh. You also have to kind of cry. Uh, I hope, though, you understand, um, really, honestly, uh, brothers and sisters, that sad and tragic, and, and, and the numbers are actually much higher than I ever dreamed or imagined of priests who have misbehaved and done terrible things. But I still say the vast majority of priests are good men, decent men, not perfect men, who work very hard every day. Um, they, they, they love God in their own way. They try to preach and, get, and help people, God's people, and um, there, there's some pretty good, decent, hardworking priests out there. So never forget that. We know you're, you're hearing only the bad news. And you have to remember, I don't have exact numbers and percentages for you, okay? But I want to just say uh, the vast majority of priests I know have always been very good men and faithful, and they're hard workers. I'm, I'm going to just say for myself, and I shouldn't have to say this, but I'm 30, almost 31 years ordained, I guess I am now. Uh, I've never, not even once, ever, ever been inappropriate or out of line sexually with anybody, not even once, as God is my witness. And I, I, I can say that most of my brother priests could say the same thing, right? We live that celibate commitment and we're faithful to it. And um, um, we're not messing around and stuff. And I'm not out there looking at porn and all these things. I, I, I'm telling you now, that's not, these are not issues, all right? So, and I don't, I shouldn't have to say that to you. And I don't want to sound like I'm boasting. I'm just grateful that God has delivered me because I know some people who really, really struggle with things like porn and uh, struggle with sexual matters. And they're like, I'm not just talking about priests. I'm talking about, I mean, I'm talking about people in general. And um, so I don't, I certainly, I say with great humility, I mean, I'm just so grateful to God that that's just not 
an issue in my life. But again, I want to say to you that I, there's a gift that we believe we receive as priests called celibacy. And it's not just a status. You can't have sex. You can't get married. But it's, it's a gift. It's a charism. It's something that God gives to men and women who live this consecrated life. So the religious sisters and the priest. And we really believe and we trust God that God can deliver us, you know, not that, uh, you know, a priest never has a dirty thought or, you know, but the, at the end of the day, it's not a huge preoccupation in his life. And that's the gift of celibacy. And an awful lot of priests receive this gift and they live it well. Some resist it, some fall. You've heard about them. But I just, I just don't want you to forget that there's a lot of really good men out there who are living faithfully uh, this call. Okay? So, so even... A great number of priests were becoming obedient to the word of God. <laughs> All right. We're going to stop here. Uh, we're going to pick up. Now, you'll see as we pick up, it gets very, very uh, tense right away. Um, we start to see the, the, the spotlight turns on all those deacons. It turns on Stephen. And he goes to work preaching. And he's, boy, he breaks all the modern preaching. Years. He goes right to work. And it's a very lengthy sermon he preaches, even longer than most of my sermons. And um, we're going to look at that sermon and see that it gets them killed. They, they, just, they just drag them out of the city and stone them for talking like this. Uh, so we're going to see that this will lead to a big break, uh, breakthrough in a way in the church. And we're going to be moving out of Jerusalem now after, after uh, next week. And the church will begin spreading in different directions. And uh, that's a good thing, even though the persecution, of course, was a very painful thing. All right. Quick final comments, questions. Um, uh, see, okay, Julia, right. Question, Father. Um, so, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that Stephen was set aside as a deacon now to serve at table instead of working with the Word of God. And then the next thing we see is him preaching. Yeah. And yeah. So I'm confused <laughs> as to how this happens. <laughs> okay. Good question, and it's still a struggle in the church today, uh, I'll tell you, with our permanent deacons especially. So here's the deal. A deacon is conformed to Christ the servant, okay, whereas a priest is conformed to Christ the priest. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, a, a, a priest is conformed to Christ the priest. Now, Christ, Jesus often referred to himself as a servant. He says, I've come among you as one who serves, right? You have seen how those, you know, uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. So we see that deacons, their first and foremost work is not preaching and is not at the altar. Their first and foremost work is in the community, serving God's people in whatever way that's most needed. Some deacons serve uh, by working at pregnancy centers, some work at hospitals, some work in the prisons, some work among the poor. So we have a lot of, all of our deacons have some tasks that they're given in the community, okay? Now, um, their secondary role is to preach and be present at the liturgy. And in, their, in the liturgy even, their main role is to represent the people. Uh, now, why is that important? Because for example, I, I think liturgically, it belongs to the deacon to read the prayers of the faithful. And not just read them, but really, ideally, if a deacon is good at this, he should prepare those prayers because he's out in the community and he's experiencing life and he has a family and he's living in the community with God's people and he knows what's going on in the community and he can therefore craft those prayers of the we call the faithful. So those are things that I think, you know, although the deacons do have a liturgical role and they do occasionally preach, you see, the struggle we sometimes have, and I teach homiletics to the deacons, okay? I teach preaching to the deacons, and they all want the big pulpit on Sunday, and they can't wait to get up there and say a few things, and I'm like, y'all, go to the lowest place. Preach daily mass. Preach at Eucharistic adoration first. You know, you hone your skills in, 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 on a Saturday morning mass before you, they all want the big pulpit, you know, they're human. But at the end of the day, we always have to remind them, no, your main role isn't to be even liturgically very active. Your main role is to be in the community serving and listening and being with God's people, okay? All right, so that's about the best I can do. But yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, the very thing that they were supposed to, the, the apostles are being relieved of, the, the scene opens and he's preaching, so. 
So, but it's a good thing. And it's sort of, we have to read between the lines, but that even at that early stage, the deacons, because they were ordained, did have some role in the liturgy, some preaching and some teaching, as well as uh, some uh, liturgical roles that they filled. Mainly, by the way, a deacon, if he's really being a deacon, should marshal the people. So one of the things my deacon does for me is that when we were all in place, you know, he makes sure everybody's in the chapel who's a minister, or the, the lectors are present, or the you serve altar servers are ready to go. So I come out of that confessional, I throw on my vestments and I'm ready to go. He's got them all lined up and ready to go. That's the kind of, you know, service that goes on in, in the liturgy that a deacon would do. Now, is it, uh, Daniel, did I see that you had a question? I can't, um, I'm seeing some kind of a, no? Okay, I can't tell. Okay, anyone else? All right. Well, we've, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's time to end. Listen, um, uh, we're going to pick up, as I said, with, with Stephen's speech uh, sermon, and uh, we'll see how it unfolds. And then, as I say, it leads to a pivotal event in the early church, which is the persecution that breaks out and scatters the disciples out of Jerusalem. They have to now break the huddle and go execute the play. In other words, bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, you see. They've been all huddled up in Jerusalem for like eight whole chapters. Now it's time to break the huddle and get out there and execute the play. And that's what we're gonna see start to happen. Uh, we're gonna begin to see the church moving out, stepping out and stepping up, okay? Good, let's pray. Lord, we thank you um, for our, this time together. Uh, um, all 24 of us <laughs> were here and uh, Blessings uh, to everyone, Lord, who, who listened. Um, to all of us, that something we've heard today will help us. Maybe the summons to courage, the summons to understand that there are going to be sacrifices for the gospel. Give us that courage, Lord. Maybe it was the, the call to be careful, prudent, and discerning, not to quickly condemn things that we don't fully understand, as Gamaliel advised. Or, and maybe it's something here related to the fact that the care of the poor is very important. And um, the church should have dedicated people uh, to this task. So whatever we take away, Lord, keep us faithful. Help us to see that the early church isn't really so different from our own experience. And keep us faithful unto death. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, let me unmute you all so you can all just sort of say bye-bye. And uh, so... Good night, Ron, Senior. Thank you so Bye, much. everybody. Okay. Uh, thank you for you. Okay, love you all. See, see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Monsignor. Thank you for the blessing. Bye, girl. Bye, bye.